pretty terrible weather out there, so thank you so much for creating these storms. Um, today, we're pleased to introduce Dr. Augustine Fuentes. Uh, Dr. Augustine Fuentes is a primatologist, received his PhD in anthropology in 1994 from the University of California, Berkeley. He's now currently the chair of the anthropology department at the University of Notre Dame. He is the author of several books, including textbooks on biological anthropology and human evolution. Today, he's going to talk about, I think, a question that becomes increasingly more important as time goes on, and that's in the context of anthropogenic global warming, as human beings encroach on other ecologies more and more, um, we find new ways uh, that human beings and other organisms are connecting themselves. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Arsene Fuentes. Thank you. So, uh, turns out that screen's a little low, so hopefully my slides will be visible. Uh, there's a couple things I, I, I want to do today, and I'll, I'll try to plow through the, the sort of me standing up here talking component as, as fast as possible, say 40 minutes or so, to, or maybe even less, to push these ideas across. I, I'd like to sort of make an argument here, not just about uh, the requirements and the ways in which we have to think about uh, approaches to, to studying primates in the Anthropocene, but also to lay out an argument to part of a larger engagement uh, for an integrated and, and really a generous anthropology, a notion of moving beyond subdisciplinary boundaries and past the kinds of a, what I would actually uh, refer to as, as lame and, and uh, unproductive disputes within anthropology and move towards an actual anthropology engagement and practice that, that gets us somewhere. So, um, Ah, there we go. All right, so I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in the interface between humans and, and, and other animals. And, and we know from the anthropological literature uh, and, and a diverse array of disciplinary literatures that this, this relationship is extremely difficult to classify. There's a number of fascinating things going on, whether we're growing ears on mice's, mouse's back, uh, domesticating cattle, interacting with primates, avoiding elephants, um, uh, having dogs, uh, uh, just amongst the people. So, so we know that there's a lot out there, and, and that it's extremely interesting. But I'd like to take a, a page from, from Gregory Bateson um, and, and, and argue that maybe we've been going about this in the wrong way. If we take ourselves out of the context in which these interfaces occur, if we don't acknowledge the role of humans and multiple other species simultaneously as part of an anthropogenic ecology in the Anthropocene, uh, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Um, I'll just give you a nod. This is a photo by Pertus Saksa on the outskirts of Harar. A uh, little nod. If you're really interested in this photo, read work by Marcus Baines Rock, an anthropologist at Macquarie University in Australia, who's done probably one of the best ethnographies of hyenas and people uh, in this area. Um, so, uh, uh, first, a little theoretical context of where I'm coming from. I'm an anthropologist who's really interested in the biological facets of humanity writ large. Um, so I'm interested in humans and other primates to contextualize this. But one thing we forget lots of times is when we talk about our genus, the genus fun, when we talk about humans, um, and I just want to nod to the evolutionary context here, we're really talking about discontinuities. We all like to focus so much on the continuities, the relationships with other primates, but part of, part of this understanding is how humans are distinct in the world and how we modified it. I mean, we're the only, the only living hominid left, and there was a whole bunch out there, so there's something obviously distinctive about the way in which we engage the world, and I'd like to suggest that that's important, and one of those real distinctive manners is the ways in which humans engage in niche construction. Um, I won't go into a big debate about evolutionary theory, but it suffice to say that the way we used to teach evolution, selection, and drift, and gene flow, that's all there, but there's a lot more going on. There are, we're in the midst of a new, new synthesis in uh, evolutionary biology, and niche construction is one of the important processes that we become aware of. Um, basically, it's the, the mutually mutable interface between organisms and environment. That organisms and environments are not in static relations or unidirectional relations. Here's why I wish I had a great 3D uh, 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 diagram, but I don't. But our traditional uh, approach has always been sort of, here's the environment, or here's the organism, and the environment interacts with organisms over time. Right? That's our sort of basic uh, somewhat simplistic representation of natural selection, but it turns out that there's substantial evidence that shows that there's mutual interfaces between organisms and environments, and so organisms respond to the pressures put on them by environments by altering those very environments, thus changing the patterns and trajectories of selection, not just for them, but for things coming after them. So there's, there's a lot of components in this construction that are extremely important. Um, a lot of animals do it. Darwin didn't realize it, but he gets one of the best examples of misconstruction with, with earthworms. You throw earthworms into soil, um, into soil with no 
um, uh, earthworms, and then they change that soil. They consume the soil, they change the aeration and structure of the soil, they change the chemical properties of the soil, thus changing the context and the ecological pressures on earthworms in subsequent generations of that soil and all the other organisms and microorganisms in that soil. So, uh, a beaver is another great example. They change local microclimates and uh, fish populations and arthropod populations and water temperature dramatically by building these dams. So it's, it's organisms interfacing with their ecologies and altering the pressures and patterns of those ecologies. Uh, why is this important? Well, it's important because we're in the Anthropocene. We are the consummate niche constructors. We haven't just modified ecologies, we've linked ecologies, we've completely changed the landscapes, we've changed the population genetics and functioning of other organisms, and, and we've built kinds of, of, of environments and landscapes that are uh, new, uh, that are distinctive on the planet. So, any understanding of organisms, humans or otherwise, in the Anthropocene requires an explicit acknowledgement that we're in an anthropogenic ecology. And, and then we have to incorporate uh, that component. So niche construction is an important component of the Anthropocene. All right. So why should anthropologists care about it? Um, because the theme of, of your uh, uh, colloquium is desires is that this is something that humans have done, and it's part of the explanation of why we succeeded and other hominins didn't. Uh, it is a drive. It is a pattern. It is a characteristic of being human. And so obviously anthropologists should care about that. Um, uh, secondly, it's not evil, right? People have this, we have this tendency to characterize humans' manipulation of the planet as a bad thing. I like hot water, right? I like the food we just had. All of these things are direct products of niche construction of ma massive modification of the environment by humans. That's what we do. So it's not good or bad. It is our pattern and understanding it is extremely important. Because niche construction is a major component of understanding evolutionary processes, Social, symbolic, and ecological inheritances set the stage for examining humans and everything that is sympathetic. Understanding human ecologies and environments means that ecological inheritance, the passing down of ecologies, but also the passing down of the social and symbolic structures are extremely important. Uh, and that means that, that intra and intergroup interactions and multi-species relationships are, are a kind of focus that is important for so I'm really interested in human alloprimate interfaces. Alloprimates are those other primate species that are sympatric or overlapping in space uh, and place with humans. Um, and I think there's some particularly interesting uh, histories here. I won't go into great detail, but, but I just want to point out here's a very simple sort of uh, general range of other primates. And you can see that they overlap extensively with humans. So the majority of the human species has, in fact, overlapped with other primates, lived in multi primate species communities for most of our evolutionary history and continues to do so today. Okay, so it's not something atypical or new. It's something quite old and quite complex. And I'd like to uh, suggest, and I'll give a few examples here, that we live in a huge range of diverse social, ecological, symbolic, conflictual, and maybe even hopeful contexts. All right, let me give you an example of a few, just to, to jump off here. You have uh, more photos by uh, the, the Finnish uh, artist, Pertu uh, Saksen. Topen Monyet is a traditional Javanese uh, form of commerce and, and representation uh, and dance. Um, Topen Monyet involves human outfits and faces placed on macaque fascicularis, long-tailed macaques, and has a centuries-old tradition as both social commentary and a local uh, type of commerce, particularly in central and uh, western Java. Um, to understand this, if you just take a look at this, I think anthropology has a role to play here. I think there's more going on than a basic ecology or structure. Um, there is some serious, not to mention this is probably going to be bad dreams tonight, but <laughs> this is amazing. I mean, the layers, the richness, the complexity, the history, the ecology, the biology, right? these things are extremely important. So just something like monkey performance in central and western Java gives us an incredible example of how much we need this sort of symbolic, rich, historical, methodological, and ethnographic uh, comparisons. Another uh, good example is something like shared pathogens. One thing people aren't aware of frequently is how extensively the pathogen sharing and co-ecologies and co-evolution have been between humans and other primates. Um, particularly uh, when it comes to things like malaria. There's a new uh, malaria uh, that has been characterized as a new emerging disease. 
uh, Plasmonium nolsi, which has been called the fifth of human malaria. It's a macaque malaria. But recent evidence demonstrates absolutely clearly that macaques and humans in Southeast Asia have been sharing, have been reservoirs for each other of nolsi, uh, and probably calciferum, uh, which nolsi was uh, misdiagnosed as for the last 30 or 40 years, um, probably been shifting back and forth uh, for centuries, if not millennia, sharing these parasites and co-shaping the diseases. The same goes through, I mean, we already know very much about the SIV-HIV linkage, uh, but uh, Lisa jones Engel and, and uh, other colleagues on, on the team that I work with have uh, shown that recently simian foamy virus, which is a macaque characteristic, widespread uh, virus in primates, but the macaque simian foamy virus, in fact, does jump to humans. It does nothing in macaques. That is, it's it's co-resonant, but it's fairly neutral. It's not pathological. But we've now found that in individuals throughout Southeast Asia who have very intense cultural and physical contact with uh, macaques, either at temples, so monks at temples, or, or screen performers, or people who own pets, that there is actually permeability in the boundaries of the bodies between the monkeys and the humans with these viruses jumping back and forth, co-creating their own sort of niche in, in, in this relationship. Again, this is a place where you can't just get at the basic ecology or basic anthropology. You need this kind of integration of, of a diverse range of areas. So, um, this is the way most people have tended to sort of envision the human other primate relationship. Conflict, competition, hunting, foods, pets, pestilence, right? This is either monkeys for pain, or they're on your dinner plate, or we watch them in conserve them. And then that's basically the traditional approach. Um, I like to suggest that that's woefully inadequate. Yeah, all those things happen, but those are just a teeny slice of the relationships that we have. Um, one could argue that anthropogenic ecologies are normative ecosystems. It's a recent publication just out last week that looked at 11,000 years of uh, phenology, uh, um, an archaeology and a phenological sampling <laughs> in Southeast Asia, clearly demonstrating radical shifts in forest structure based on human habitation without agriculture. It's pre-agriculture, right? Not, not looking at agriculture, but actually forest plant movement and a lot of other structures. The whole idea that humans haven't had substantial effects even on what we call natural forests is, is wrong. So anthropogenic ecology is so important. Human actions matter. Um, we also know, at least from the malaria work, from some of the viral work, and probably from some uh, behavioral and ecological work, that co-evolutionary histories have a lot to do with the modern distribution of other primates. Um, and I will give you some uh, evidence here, and we also have some other studies that demonstrate this, that anthropogenic ecologies, the relationship between humans and other primates, actually shapes the structure, the population structure, and the genetics of the species. Now, we know this for domesticated species, but we tend to ignore this for many other species that are syntactic and co-resonant with humans. Um, again, pathogens, conflicts, and coexistence are important. Crop rating is, 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 is an issue. There's a variety of things with urban monkeys. Um, and, and, and I'd like to point out that at the bottom one, we won't talk too much about that, but but the notion that other primates in many societies play an important part of the human social fabric. Actually, important not just as symbols, but actually important as daily participants in, in, in social, social life. Um, you, you probably already know, I've been uh, pushing uh, along with a number of colleagues a sort of position called ethnoprimatology. Uh, here, ethno does not mean sort of what it means in ethnobotany or ethnoecology. We're not asking about non-Western takes on a particular Western practice of science. We're actually talking about an integration of ethnography with primatological practices, a notion of giving an explicit role for humans as part of the ecosystems and landscapes of interest to other primates. Um, and ethnoprimatology has been, been influenced as sort of as a hybrid uh, of, of not just anthropologies, but also uh, the animal welfare movement um, and uh, uh, sort of animal studies movement in, in a broader sense as well. Um, <clears throat> All the movements have a manifesto, so colleagues and I have come up with one for this, and I just uh, briefly want to run through it. Um, the basic ideas here are that um, normative behaviors, we, we, we've, I was trained to go away from people as much as possible and study monkeys in their natural environment. Right? So you can find real stuff. A lot of stuff is messed up by humans. Okay, so I went to one of the most remote places on the planet, Mentawi Islands, on the outer edge of the world off the west coast of Sumatra. Um, they are ridiculously remote. Um, they're probably not even, oh, they're on this map, yeah, okay, so right here, Kapalawam and Tawai, right off there, there is not, this is as far away as you can get from the world, it's almost impossible to get to, even today. Um, now, what did 
did I find? I found a complex relationship between the four endemic, there's four species of primates that are found nowhere else in the world, the four endemic primates and the humans had a multi thousand year history of relationship there. I couldn't get the humans out of the future, even if I tried. Um, so uh, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, most primate populations have been influenced by other humans. Um, and, and here's one that I think is particularly important for all anthropologists to think about, and that is because of the particular biological, phylogenetic, and behavioral relationships between humans and other primates, we are primates after all, because of those relationships, there's something particularly interesting from an anthropological perspective about the relationships between humans and other primates. And also, if we're going to take this approach, we have to recognize the potential for fluidity and boundaries between humans and other primates, not, not just physical boundaries, such as pathogen sharing or sort of mutual uh, emotional interfaces, but in fact actual uh, sort of perceptual boundaries in the way in which we relate to one another. Um, so here's the last of my theoretical position before I actually give you some details as to what I'm talking about. But I'd like to demonstrate with just a number of anthropological contributions, that is, anthropologists who have something to say that supports this sort of kind of integrative perspective. Um, there's a recent, Anna Singh received an enormous grant um, uh, uh, from the Swedish Academy, I think, to develop a very large project called Living in the Anthropocene, which is entitled Discovering the Potential of Unintentional Design on Anthropogenic Landscapes. The idea that our niche construction cascades in many ways, not just on us, but in everything around us. And that, that is becoming a core part of the anthropological uh, inquiry. Uh, Philippe Descola recently argued, uh, as many, many, many people have, since it's nothing new, but the, the construction of social reality for humans needs, is based in the interaction between human beings and their natural environment. Uh, I take out natural, I, I disagree with you, I don't think natural helps us in this sentence, but the basic idea is that what I was arguing, what Bateson argued uh, back in, in, in the early 70s, that to, to, to pull the mind, the human, the essence, the person out of the ecology and the landscape is a deadly mistake, and it's going to lead to, to a bad ways of thinking about being human. Um, uh, Clifford Geertz really spent a lot of time arguing about humans making the environment a dimension of themselves, and I would have to argue that the converse is also true. Um, uh, Hugh Raffles in the Animal Studies Program at the New School for Social Research, this is a complicated sentence to read, but it's actually really important. He really argues that there is a really real, both in biophysicality of nature uh, and of human experience, but also in, in the discursive materiality. Right? So it's not just the material, the really real encompasses all of that, and that's what anthropology can provide that many other approaches can. <coughs> Phyllis Dolanow, years ago, 40 years ago, argued that we can't just look at primate behavior, but we have to ask, what are all the patterns and relationships to the patterns to one another? And more recently, Karen Spryer said, look, if they're really interested in conservation, we have to take all of these different kinds of things into play. Now, these individuals are not in, in conversation with one another. But they're all coming to the same point, or at least I would like to think they are, and I'm incorporating their diverse perspectives to argue for an integrated approach to understanding primates in the world today, and that anthropologists are particularly well suited to do that. Um, whether we're looking at uh, co residents of different species of primates, here we have a young male uh, Homo sapiens, a young male Macaca mulata hanging out, eating on a building in northern India. Um, here we have a macaque nemestrina and a homo sapiens collaborating on a very important economic uh, investment. This is the coconut picking macaques uh, in, in Thailand. Uh, Leslie Sponsel of the University of Hawaii has done some fantastic work on this uh, scenario. Um, here we have something that is becoming increasingly common, but has been common for a long time in Southeast Asia, and that is a real urban. We talk about the urban jungle. No, this is, there are no trees in Bopuri, Thailand, none whatsoever. This is a reality. Uh, very interesting reality. Um, whether if you've ever been to Hong Kong and driven through the Kowloon Hills on a Saturday or Sunday, you've seen all of these guys. These are hybrid rhesus, along with whatever else is thrown in there, probably three or four other different species. Um, the cats aren't too picky, um, and, and, and they're sitting waiting for the tourists to come up and, and have a Sunday picnic in the park and fill them. Uh, Hong Kong, one of the most dense places on the planet. Um, in Bali, which I'll talk about momentarily, where we have these complex, not just human macaque relationships, but these multi-species contexts that are riveted, centered, engaged in Balinese ritual tradition, religious orientation, and agricultural systems. Uh, and and I just like to say that, and I'm going to talk about macaques here. Everywhere you go throughout Southeast Asia and South Asia, everywhere from Afghanistan to New Guinea. 
before you look in the rearview mirror, you're going to see them again. Almost everywhere where there are humans. That, 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 for me, is an important anthropological approach. But this happens everywhere, where there's co-residence. Loretta Cormier's wonderful work on the Guaja and their overlap and extended kinship system where individuals involve non-human primates, not just as symbolic kin, but as practical kin within their social system. Um, I highly recommend, this is a great teaching monograph. Um, uh, Laura does a great job of, of integrating ecological, behavioral, and ethnographic work uh, in that. If you are really interested in the cutting edge of ethnoprimatology, Melissa Remis, biological anthropologist, and Rebecca Harden, and Melissa Remis is at Purdue, and Rebecca Harden is a cultural anthropologist at Michigan, have been working for the last decade in the uh, Central African Republic doing amazing work working at ethnographic, economic, political, ecological, and behavioral literature and field studies that integrate primates, other animals, social political context, and histories into a really complex, beautiful narrative that's probably going to set the stage for the way in which we talk about these kinds of, of relationships. Same things are going on in Sulawesi, the work of uh, uh, Aaron Riley um, in West Africa, with chimpanzees and humans, work by Kim Hopkins. There's a lot of people doing this work. All right. Let me give you two examples that I hope will drive home this point and illustrate. I'm talking fast, I'm throwing a lot of information out there, but my goal is to spend a little bit more time giving you two examples to show you why I'm convinced that you need an integrative anthropology to really get somewhere with this. Uh, and those two examples are based on work that I've conducted uh, that I, and I say I, meaning me and about 50 other people as part of a large complex team, because another thing that this approach mandates there's no longer that ability to go out for one person to do work. You have to work in teams. We can't know enough, and we will make mistakes when we try to do this kind of stuff well. So it's large teamwork in, in all of these contexts. So let me give an example from our work in Bali, just highlighting a few complexities and, and interesting things that have happened. Now, all of you probably know where Bali is. It's a province of Indonesia. It's its own island. Um, it's the smallest uh, total province, but it's the third wealthiest. Um, it's there just to the east of Java. Um, and, and, and Bali is, is inhabited by a, a lot of people, but also uh, by a lot of monkeys, particularly the long-tailed macaque, uh, Macaca vesicularis. And so my interest in, in Bali is the relationship between these two species. And let me just give you a very, very brief uh, little moment here. Ibu Wayan owns this shop here. It's a small water and a small shop where she sells a few things. Um, it's in one area of uh, southeastern <clears throat> Bali. And every morning, this male's troop, there's about 60 animals, which lives up on this big plateau hill here, comes down from the hill, comes down through the edge of this village, crosses the one highway that is through its two lane road, uh, into the forest on the other side to forage, uh, maybe raise some crops. And, it happens every day. And every day you see this group of 50 or 60 animals come down, and this young male, it's about now he's about 11, but he was about 7 when this was taken, this young male sort of veers off, comes over, walks over to Ibu Wayan, there, she sits down with him, and uh, hands him some peanuts, and they share a meal together. Every day, every morning, this just didn't happen. I don't know if it started. She says he's been doing it since he was little. Um, she says she doesn't know why. He just, they, they had a relationship, they hit it off. And he continues to do that. And it's this kind of relationship, this idiosyncratic event, that actually repeats itself in a number of different ways throughout the island. And my question is, why? What is going on? What does this mean? And from a primatological perspective, what does it mean for this group, this individual, and this species on this island? So that, that's what that sort of spurs on uh, a lot of the work that I've done in Bali. So long-tailed macaque, we know a lot about them. They're the uh, favorite, uh, uh, or now at least, since they stopped selling rhesus in India. They're one of the favorite uh, biomedical mon monkeys uh, because you can torture them horrendously and they stay alive. Um, and they also have some good you know, overlap with immune function and so obesity and other things with humans. Um, we know a lot about their behavioral ecology. We know about their sort of patterns in Bali. We know about their bodies and their lives. We also know a lot about Bali. There's one island that has had, uh, I would argue, overexposure to anthropologists. That's Bali. If you walk into Bali and say, I'm an anthropologist, everyone's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> We know a lot about the way in which Bali has recreated itself multiple times in, 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 in a semiotic, and symbolic, and religious, economic, and political way. It has a very rich and complex history. 
that goes back millennia for the last five or six centuries include not only incredible interfaces with diverse colonial powers, but also a recreation of self and a re-imaging and a re-imagining of Hinduism and econ economics and even global tourism. Um, so there's a lot going on. And anthropology for the last century, since early 1900s, has a great interest in this, in this process. So we know a lot about the monkeys. We know a lot about the island. But I was really shocked to find we know almost nothing, or knew up until recently, almost nothing about the, the interface between these, these two areas. So the core, or at least what, what we're finding is the core to this, is, is this sort of Balinese agricultural system, which is incredibly complex, which is based on uh, Balinese Hinduism, the agrarian system, the wet rice agriculture, the incredibly rich soils, and the temple and uh, subak system. The subaks are, are um, agricultural communities that are associated with particular temples, associated with particular Hinduism that is practiced in Bali. And these subak communities are communities of humans and villages that share water, water sheds, basically. And so the water moves through the planting cycle through these, thus stratifying and structuring the environment. So the subak system has, and uh, Stephen Lansing's work, uh, I thought Stephen Lansing has been excellent on, on laying out the ecology of this, and its impact on many, many different both uh, animal and plant species. It structures the ecology in such a way that there's patterned infrastructure of, of agriculture, trees, and water in a consistent, predictable way, and that this has been going on for, for probably 800 to 1,200 years. So the Balinese landscape is a mixture of tourism, of cities, of wet rice agriculture, of temples, all of these things can be sort of then envisioned and modified, simplified, if you will, into a series of GIS layers. We like to do this for analysis. You can't really do this. This doesn't get us at it. But if you want to measure something, you've got to start somewhere. right? And so we have many, many, many layers. Here's five of the simplest, sort of most basic layers. right? That is basically yellow is wet rice agriculture, which you can tell is really important. Red is uh, cities and, and towns, is basically urbanization, right? Villages and towns. Uh, and then green is forest cover. Bali has extensive forest cover, and the forest cover has been increasing since the 1970s. Uh, so that, that's very interesting. But more interesting is when you compare this with the substantial macaque populations. Okay? All of these dots represent a population that we have good data on. Now, well, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. They are not living in the forests. In fact, we just completed a, a student uh, from Belgium, Fanny Brockmar, just completed a big survey of this entire area. There are very few monkeys in the forests. <laughs> monkeys, and macaques in general, don't love deep forests, but they don't want forests. They want people. They want people and agriculture for some very particular reasons. And so right away, there's something really interesting that's showing us that 10 to 15,000 macaque monkeys are intentionally living in and around humans for particular reasons. All right, so we spent a decade or so trying to piece together uh, macaque ecology and figure out what's going on. And interestingly, here's the punchline, the short, simplified, easy version of what we found. <laughs> so my original, I was really interested in going to study the, the Bayer ecology of macaques, so we're like, oh, well, I mean, tell me the macaques are interacting with the Balinese people, so we better study. So we start studying that, and we're like, oh, but these tourists are really, really important. And we're like, well, this whole land use pattern, agriculture, and then they just spun out and got ridiculous. And it turns out that to understand why a macaque monkey goes from here to here, right, uh, different sites, or why they're eating what they're eating, or why we're finding some interesting pathogen profiles or obesity profiles, um, you actually have to have these patterns as part of your ecological measure. This is an ecology. You have to understand it. And we found out, too, in 1999, with this huge uh, simultaneous political shift in Indonesia with the, in the fall of the dictatorship, uh, and a reduction in central power control and the decline in the global palm or palm oil market, no, global coconut oil market, you saw a radical change in the tourism industry, which then was followed by another radical change with the Bali bombings. We should actually measure those outcomes in the bodies of macaques. So the Bali bombings changed tourism patterns, which actually caused the macaque population structure to shift at some core tourism. I would not have predicted that. Now it makes perfect sense. So, but there's, now I want to talk to you about two other things. This is this broader, really interesting, complicated area. But there are two areas that aren't even mapped up here that are 
are ways to quantitatively get at some of this impact when we're talking about sclerosis, but focused on the bodies of the macaques. And that's population genetics and parasites. We know a lot about macaque genetics and behavior. Here's an example. So if you look at macaque fascicularis, macaque monkeys, those females stay where they are. They don't move. They stay in their groups. Males move. If you look at their mitochondrial DNA and their Y DNA, you can see it, right? I mean, we know where every female is from. We know where every male is from, and they're all over the place. There's no pattern, right? The males move all over, the females don't. But this is a little bit more interesting. So we did a more in-depth analysis of 15 of these populations spread around the island, um, looking at a variety of different loci, and looking at over three, about 345 individuals, actually it's about 378, but there's some that aren't included here. And we just sort of created a, an FST balance. That is basically looking at the variation between populations to see how much they differ. And all the populations except for two were easily differentiated. That is, we could tell individuals apart by their population of origin. Good. So that's a standard thing. We should be able to then map that and look at this sort of gene flow across the area. The problem was, when you map all this variation on a traditional, like for example, a Mantel test to look at geographic distance versus diversity, it doesn't map. There was no correlation between how far or close apart these populations were and their pattern of genetic differentiation, which is absolutely unexpected. It's absolutely unexpected until we go back and ask questions about what's, what's really between these things. It's not about geographic distance. It's about their connections via different temple, subak systems, riparian systems, agricultural systems, and tourist locations. So for example, we looked at uh, putative first uh, generation migrants and populations. 50% of all the ones that we could identify as first generation migrants were all going to one site. Right? One site in the center of the island, which is the largest population, the most managed population. Um, so there's interesting cues and patterns of migration that macaques are using that are based on the human manipulation and engagement with the environment that are changing the way in which the macaque population structures look. Um, and we have, I don't have time to show you, maybe afterwards I can, we've developed a large, uh, very complicated, too complicated, agent-based model looking at all of the, using about uh, 80 layers of different components, including ethnographic data and geophysical layers and um, pathogen layers and a variety of other things, to sort of try to give models to ways in which macaques might be moving around this landscape. Uh, I can go into detail like that in the Q&A if you'd like, and I have a video of it so you can see what it looks like. But what it shows us is that different sites have different kinds of things that impact them. In some sites, transmission of gut bacteria, for example, were heavily influenced by forest cover. In other sites, they were influenced by tourist cover. In some sites, none of our measures influenced or predicted the pattern. So each sites were reading or interfacing or engaging with the endogenic ecologies and histories in, in, in very different ways. Um, and we know that, that, that it is the interface and the trade-offs between rice agriculture and tourism that is in the process of reshaping the landscape of quality right now. And so future questions that we're really interested in are looking at how the sort of shift away from rice agriculture and increased focus on diverse types of tourism is changing what the landscape looks like and how you might be able to predict where that's driving um, macaque genetics and obviously where it's going in regards to uh, pathogen transfer. There's a monkey on, on this guy's head uh, about three seconds before he leaves, but part of his intestinal tract remains on the guy's head, so, which is extremely developed. This is the site of Ubud Barantugal where we've got a multi-generational, uh, 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 macaque generational study project going by many, many Balinese, Indonesian colleagues, and other colleagues from around the world. And I just want to show you something about research. I'm not excluding the researchers from this whole equation. So we maintained a large research project there, working with the local temple, uh, the priests, and the local villages on a new management system. Um, inherited from Bruce Wheatley's work in the late 80s, early 90s, we began working here in, extensively in the mid-90s, and by 98, we've instituted a new management system, working using science-based approaches, that is data on health, on food, on ranging use, on genetics, obesity levels, fat, skin fat folds, things like that. So we developed, in concert with the, the local scientists and the local people, um, a management plan which worked. I don't know if you guys picked up on this. <laughs> but <laughs> we started, there were about 150 monkeys. Now, uh, actually, though this is 2009, the latest count uh, was up until this summer 2012. Right? In May 2012, it was about 671 monkeys. 
We've expanded the area. They've been purchasing land because the tourism boom has been enormous. This site generates over $200,000 US annually for just for the local village. Uh, so it's a huge economic boom. So obviously, they're very interested in maintaining this management. The problem is the monkeys are doing incredibly well. Not only are they reproducing like crazy and dying at an incredibly low rate, but migrants are sh coming in from other places, which is interesting. How they're finding out about that, we don't know. Plus, we think people are dumping monkeys here. So. <laughs> But it's very interesting that they, 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 it becoming a focus of research has radically altered the primate landscape, right? The monkeys, the behavioral ecology, the social networks, everything. Um, and just like in 1994, as the population was growing, there was a big outbreak. In 2012, 20% of the macaque population died because of the Streptococcus suis outbreak, a pig strep, um, from a number of, there's some pig farms, open pig farms in the area. And we think there's a correlation between macaque density the life of that strep is in around that area all the time, but sometimes, 1994 and again in 2012, it, it slams the population. Interestingly, in both cases, the Temple community reacted extremely quickly and used money to purchase um, antibiotics for all the monkeys and hired about 70 radiated villagers out there giving antibiotics to all the monkeys to minimize the impact. So again, cultural context really shaped the lives of these mechanics. All right, let's go somewhere completely different to, uh, it's not working now. Okay, let's go somewhere completely different to, uh, to wrap this up, give you another uh, somewhat distinct example. There's uh, Gibraltar. I show you this map. And Gibraltar is southern Spain. Gibraltar is a UK uh, uh, colony, basically. It's part of the United Kingdom. Um, but it's an independent colony, territory in the United Kingdom. It's part of Spain. Uh, the UK got it from Spain about 300 years ago. Spain should probably recognize that. I'm a little pissed off uh, about all that. But anyways, it's there. It's a southern tip. I show you this picture because uh, recently someone introduced me. I was giving me a copy of Gibraltar and said, uh, Augustine Fuentes is conducting research on the island of Gibraltar off the coast of Portugal. So just in case <laughs> people don't know where it is, uh, that's where it is. It's a fascinating, uh, very, very interesting historical uh, for a number of reasons. And one of the most important reasons is that we have at least 29,000 years of continuous habitation by initially Neanderthals and then humans. Uh, we have an incredible archaeological record on this site. So and it's an interesting place. If you ever go there, you'll see why people say it's, it's really cool. Anyways, I'm interested in the Cactus Sylvanus. Right, the uh, Barbary macaque, or as they're called there, the Barbary ape. Um, and there are about 250 macaque sylvanus on the rock uh, in, the, in Gibraltar, uh, which makes up a significant portion of the approximately eight to 9,000 left on the planet. Uh, this is severely endangered. It's endangered, not ranked. It's critically endangered yet, but will be in the next IUCN round. Um, the rest of the populations live exclusively in Morocco and Algeria, in small, isolated patches. Now, at least since the uh, early teens, we know that the humans and the monkeys, and actually the, the, the literature goes back at least 300 years, if not 700 years, of overlap between monkeys and, and humans uh, in Gibraltar. But we know at least because of Gibraltar Carnival, uh, since the 19 teens and 20s, people have been complaining about you know, monkeys coming in and stealing stuff out of their kitchen. Uh, and and, and then the monkeys have played an important role. Uh, this is a great, a great story about the poor Wilfred who they brought from Morocco who couldn't integrate into the population and eventually got beat up by one of the males and had to be killed with a shotgun. But that's another <laughs> And Winston Churchill made the famous claim, right, that as long as the rock, the apes are on the rock, it shall be British. Uh, there, there's, there's an incredible symbolic and practical real relationship between the monkeys and, and, and humans uh, in Gibraltar. So we know that they live in this upper rock nature reserve. This whole upper part of, this is the rock of Gibraltar, it's a beautiful place. The upper rock nature reserve has a number of species, it's a protected area, and we know they live up there, but we also know that for the multiple centuries, uh, they've been coming into town and coming into conflict with humans when they come into town. Um, and so, oops, one of our, our real interests is, well, what, what's, what's, what's going on, and, and how do we assess this? So we incorporated uh, a bunch of new research colleagues. Uh, these are some of the facts from different troops there. Um, and have been pioneering uh, a use, a widespread use of GPS telemetry. Um, we did a number of experiments to show that these collars do not harm them and impact them in any negative way, including long term deployment. These are GPS collars on these different individuals that record every half hour a GPS point and a little bit of other information. Uh, and we leave them on five to six months, and then the collars we program them to drop off. So it's only involves one capture and attaching the collar, and then we can actually program the collar to drop off and we pick it up so we don't have to recapture the monkey. 
Um, but that gives us thousands and thousands of data points for all of their movement that we can then correlate. We don't have to be there watching them. They're collecting the data points. And this is my new innovation in primatology, get the monkeys to collect all your data points. <laughs> um, so they're collecting data for us because our question is, okay, well, there's all these stories and all these interesting explanations and hypotheses about why they go into town and why they don't and how they move and how they use the rock. Let's ask them and let's get some real data. Uh, uh, so, so we did that. And what we've been doing, what you're seeing here is two months worth of data from different groups of individuals moving around the rock <laughs> into town and around town and influencing one another, influencing something that's going on in the human areas that's drawing them or repelling them, moving around. And what we've been able to do is to construct an enormous database that we can then test a number of assumptions and that we can correlate with a number of different possible ideas as to why they do what they do. Okay. Um, so these kinds of data are incredible, and they're leading us to a few really important uh, conclusions, at least so far. We'll be presenting most of these data in the next year and publishing them shortly thereafter. Uh, what we see here, I'm just, just running through, what we're able to see is two really important things. The monkey groups seem to influence one another, but not nearly as much as things going on around them. There are things that are pulling them out and bringing them back in. Uh, and, and we're trying to find out what those are. And there's some very interesting patterns, construction patterns, garbage patterns, um, uh, festival patterns, birthday patterns, uh, event uses of the local event halls, school schedules, a variety of different kinds of things that are part and parcel of the local ecology of these species. And so understanding it is very important. Another thing we're finding out is that a lot of our assumptions about day range and home range in primates are usually calculated by us following monkeys. And so we're comparing what we get when we follow them um, and what they get, what we get from actually their own movements. And we're doing a number of different kinds of analyses of the data and range, finding out that many of our assumptions about ranging are pretty far off. And so our assumptions about the energy acquired in ranging are also pretty far off, which has made a cornerstone of much kind of logical arguments for behavior. Uh, and so we'll see how those are received when we start publishing them. But the other thing is, is, is it gives us this really interesting. So here's, here's July 7th, um, and we have Sylvia. This is a, the one female who's wearing a bunch. This is the whole polygon area. She can cover that later, but her dots are off in that area. This is Sylvia's range on July 7th, uh, and, and here's Sylvia's range on July 8th. Um, around midday, and we have the timing. We know when this happens. Around midday, Sylvia cruised down from the middle of the hill, shot across Trafalgar Cemetery in the taxi stop, hung out for about half an hour in a fig tree in another cemetery, and then cruised out here to this newly constructed series of condos. <laughs> Spent about an hour and a half in the condos, right on the, across town, and then went back up. What was going on? Well, it took us a while to figure out, but there were uh, this sort of excavation and cleaning out of some of the condos, and the workers had a big giant barbecue that day. Uh, and so they left out, they don't even eat, these monkeys don't even eat, they left, there's just tons of garbage and detritus and sangria leftovers and punch and fruits and all that sort of stuff. And what we didn't realize, and we get to go back up to look where a lot of them roost in the late morning, you have a perfect eyesight, perfect line. It's not that far, right? It's, it's about a kilometer maybe. Um, and you can see the smoke and you can see indications. If you look really carefully, you can see people moving around there. We had no idea that these monkeys up here are monitoring a lot of human activity across a very wide range and are using human cues to actually move into these areas. And we've been able to sort of demonstrate a number of one-off events. Now, one-off events don't prove anything, right? But it, it supports these ideas that this local ecology is much broader than just the trees. And it's not like they don't eat up here. We, we know they eat 66 different species of naturally occurring plants up here. So they have plenty of food and they're provisioned up here. They're not going down here because of nutrition. They're going down there because it's part of their foraging and ranging, and it's part of the way in which they navigate the environment. So anyways, these are just sort of two examples of, of, of what, what goes on in these complex realities. Um, and, and what we found, yeah, I don't recommend putting a 40 pound. <laughs> the, the Brits have this sort of real uh, gung-ho notion about that. Um, I would point out, though, if you're going to do it, do it with the Macacus sylvanus. They are the most mellow monkeys I've ever encountered in my life. The bite rate on these guys with tourists is the lowest of any study that anyone's done. <laughs> if you're going to mess with anyone, mess with one of them. 
Um, but what we found is these incredible relationships between humans and monkeys uh, act as, in a standard ecological paradigm, they're foundational species. So all of the other species around cascade off of the infrastructures and the patterns set up by this relationship between the monkeys and the humans. We also found out that these relationships create chemical signatures in the bodies of the monkeys. Um, uh, carbon and nitrogen isotope residues uh, uh, illustrate clearly the separation of one group from these other groups because of a particular differential relationship it has with people. Um, and so we, we published that and looked at those things. We also found something completely shocking, which we published only hesitantly, and now we're just trying to really double check. These monkeys have almost none of the pathogens common to all mechanics. No herpes, no, none of the uh, SIVs, uh, none of the STLVs. Uh, they're completely pathogen free. They, they have very few human pathogens as well, which is completely atypical in the fact that they interact with uh, hundreds of thousands of people. So something is going on with these monkeys. And, it's, it's very, and we're trying to convince the government of Morocco to let us in and test the Moroccan uh, monkeys to see whether or not this is characteristic of the species, which would be radical, that there are attacks out there that aren't just loaded with, with viral pathogens. Um, but we don't. So all of this comes out of that. Bottom line. Bottom line of this is Hong Kong with monkeys again. I just want to drive this home because I've talked to every person I know who's ever gone to Hong Kong was like, there's monkeys in Hong Kong. Like, there's thousands of monkeys in Hong Kong, but you have to know where to go see them. My, my bottom line here is that anthropogenic habitats and human niche construction, climate change, landscape manipulation, urbanization, population growth, that's going on. That's not going to change. None of that is stopping. So it has to be part of our engagement. It's not just as primatologists, but as anthropologists. The multi speciesness of the Anthropocene requires demands that anthropologists take, take an integrative and, and complex approach to it. Um, there is potential for sustainability between humans and other species. Uh, it's complicated, but we have, we have scenarios where these communities exist. Um, and I think entangled desires, the desires of the humans, the monkeys, replete with conflict, commensalisms, communities, co-ecologies, and mutual futures, are where, where we should be. It's where anthropology can contribute. We need anthropology in the broad sense, in, in an engaged, integrative, and, and generous sense to be active, because otherwise our data are going to be limited, our conclusions are incomplete, and sort of the ways in which we can talk about the world are going to suffer. Thank you very much. So let's open the floor to questions. Environmental differences from others in the in, 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 if you want to say more natural population, not urban populations, and and or whether you it, it, is it a real stark contrast, or you said they say it's just flexibility and behavior, and then and therefore you have to in some ways calculate energy energy use and so forth on the basis of sort of site specific <coughs> populations, if you will. I think it's the latter one. I think that there's so much variation in flexibility. If you just look at all the published data, which isn't very much for uh, macaca savannas ranging, um, it, it, it goes from, and this is common for a lot of primates, but it goes from a couple hectares to 140 hectares, right? For groups of approximately the same size um, and health. So, so yeah, I, I think it becomes incredibly localized. And, and that's what we're finding from, we're doing the same thing in Singapore uh, as well. Um, and we're trying to collaborate with some others doing, um, Tony Di Fiore is doing some of this in uh, Ecuador as well. And so there's a number of people now getting very, very, very rich data um, uh, on, on this kind of ranging stuff. And it's, it's problematizing it. This all started with David Sprague in, in, uh, in, uh, in Japan, uh, hooked up, put one of these early giant, really, really high quality GPS on one of his students as a backpack. And then had three or four other students chase that student around and take measures. And so they got the measures of the individual moving, and then all these people taking different measures of them. And he published a very ignored article showing that, wow, the differences were enormous. Uh, and, and since then, people have been more and more looking at it. Uh, and we'd do much more of this if it wasn't so expensive. Uh, telemetry is ridiculously expensive for a group of humans. But yeah, I, I think what this is going to push us towards is local ecologies matter. And that standard sort of gloss energetic budgets are problematic um, when you don't have micro, micro uh, sort of scale. Are you doing satellite GPS or are you recording the satellite GPS? 
So you can go out there when these months, this is the, when they, they have that on there. So you, you go out there, we leave it on for six months. You go out there with a little antenna and a little netbook. If you're within 500 meters, depending on the weather and all that, 500 to 200 meters, you just connect up and you download all the data. You don't even have to see the monkey. And then it drops off. But you, you, we have all the data before the caller is even done in the deployment. But you can do satellite would be so much cheaper. It's like lots and lots of animals. It would be so much cheaper, but we wouldn't have the access to the sort of ongoing. We'd be able to monitor them in the same way. So you could do it and just store a bunch of data, but then you have to recapture the animals. No, because you have the drop off. Yeah, the drop offs are harder to do. Because with the satellite <laughs> one, what we can do is send a signal. The radio ones, you can send a signal, but we tried a bunch of different ones, and the, resi the resiliency wasn't so good. And we're at the point where we have almost 80% success rates, um, whereas most of the other ones are happy with much lower rates. And we're really trying to, to get a, a system where it requires only one capture, and that it, it's really safe. The biggest problem now is battery size, right? Uh, batteries are, are the, the huge weight problem. We could get much smaller, they have much smaller ones if you don't want them to take a record every half hour. We started doing it every 15 minutes in the day, were incredible, but it just, you can only get a two or three month deployment. And how often, I guess, do you have to download the data, look at it, to compare to the local events? Well, what we're, so we didn't realize how much the local events were going to impact. So our first deployments in Singapore, we did two or three sample of deployments. Those are really hard to have all these data, and we're trying to piece back through bus schedules and trash routes and going house to house and housing and uh, saying, did you guys have parties during this time or something like that. But now that we know that it's going on, we can keep sort of more management on it. And so most of it is managing the areas around and trying to see what's going on and downloading the data and try to um, also, the really nice thing is we're able to, if you have multiple groups of the, that are above each other or that are in the same area, you can look at both the group's relationship to one another plus their relationship. You know, statistically, you can then sort of create uh, modalities of measuring multiple levels of the potential cost of that. It's really cool, and you've got to know some really good uh, bioinformatics folks to, to, to get at it. But uh, we're, we're developing that. Okay. Yes, you, have an, you focus on primates, obviously, but I'm just wondering, is there any sort of qualitative difference between interactions between humans and other mammals or those? I think there is. I think there's a big difference. I, that, that not to denigrate or play down some of the other mammals. I think uh, Marcus Payne's rock, uh, the work between uh, the relationship, the reality of hyenas and people in the city of Harar, uh, you've got to read this history. He's got a couple articles coming out. But this, there's three centuries of overlap. You walk through the streets of Harar, and at, at night, hyenas walk by you. And, and if you're a citizen of Harare, you know what to say to them so that they keep walking by you and they hang out and they're there the whole time. Um, there's this very, very long relationship throughout Ethiopia. There's a couple studies that suggest that the human uh, hyena commensalism is uh, a couple hundred thousand years old and it's probably had some interesting relationships with scavenging and, and, and predation. So I think there's a lot of really interesting, complex relationships out there. I haven't been particularly interested in non-human primates. So my interest is in particular kinds of relationships that you can get between humans and primates. And I end with this slide for a number, number of reasons, uh, to show that there are some, some physiological patterns that are common. I mean, you know, we can do this just not to, to uh, stretch that whole analogy, but uh, there, this monkey is also named Fuentes. <laughs> uh, you can just, uh, they, yeah, it's too bad, I was really bummed, because they named, you know, they named after the researchers were there, so when he was born, they gave him that name. Yeah, he got a little out of hand and ended up being called, so that no, was a little <laughs> but anyways, the bottom line is that there are particularities, there are distinctive characteristics of overlap between humans and, and other primates. I'm not saying that it's more important than other relationships, I'm just the physical ones I'm interested in. I think there's incredible work done on sort of human coyote stuff in Chicago right now. The, Cut, the Chicago Coyote Project, they're a great website, you can take a look at that. Um, there's some really good work uh, that we're helping coordinate in Singapore, looking at um, civet human relationships. Uh, I didn't realize that there are civets living all in and around humans in Singapore, and we're actually helping them develop collars for civet telemetry. Um, so there's a lot of really common, human, the human elephant stuff is, is amazing. There's a recent uh, paper on ethno-elephantology. Uh, <laughs> it's a summary of a review paper of all the human elephant studies, and it's, it's really fascinating. So there's a lot out there. I just happen to be really interested in those primates. Do you find a link between um, an individual's monkey propensity to engage humans and their propensity to engage the social life of their own? Uh, you know, that's a great question. No one's looked that closely. 
Uh, because what happened is we started looking really intensively at things like that in, in monkey behavior and human behavior at, at one or two sites in Bali. And then it soon became evident to me that there were some big patterns going on here. And so I became really interested instead of just the local the individual details, these big patterns, because I didn't know what was going on. And I realized that our current modeling systems were woefully inadequate. So we've been working on developing these really large models, and that's another reason that population genetics have become so important in large-scale population ranging, because you need that as the template to get into the individual stuff. We started asking questions, realizing, well, we don't have any of the genetics. Yeah, but we're not, we're just gonna be faking the answers. So, so once you get this sort of, some of this big ecological and biological baseline, then you can get in, I think, and really do the higher quality. So right now, Fanny Brockhorn, a, a, a student, uh, uh, from Belgium, just finished her PhD research and she'll be defending in fall. And what she did is intensive, traditional behavioral ecology, including all of these different variables at three sites in Bali. And her results are spectacular. And they're, they're getting much more at that. Like, for example, one of those, remember that I showed you the forest area where there were very few groups? Well, she did follow one group in that, that big sort of national park forest area. And that group, which I had suggested because I'd seen this a few times, but I only had anecdotal data, that group's ranging you go three or four months and they're hanging out in these areas, hanging, and all of a sudden, the entire group will move over and hang out at this forest edge place two to three days before a local Hindu festival. And they'll do it consistently. <laughs> and so, so even, even these groups that don't spend a lot of time directly engaging with humans have the human cycle. You know, that's not surprising. I mean, I've been following groups in, in forests that no one you know, trees fruiting days before it fruits. So it's, it's part of local ecology. And we just gotta get over ourselves that humans aren't part of everything and take that seriously. Yeah. I'm extremely interested, interested about the so many wide ranging issues uh, from so many different disciplines. Um, uh, one question that comes to my mind is uh, that um, uh, you know, the issue of fitness yeah. of primates and uh, the preference for different land uses, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's tourists uh, or uh, people or temples or whatever, you know, that diagram is a, is a shown of dissolution, mm -hmm. you know, of primates. Did you relate it to the fitness? Well, we can, it's hard to measure that sort of actual fitness, but what we do measure is uh, group size and density and overall health. And yeah. at least in Bali, there is a correlate between size of the group, um, longevity of individuals, and reproductive output of females, and tourist temple sites. So the, the more frequented a temple site is by tourists in a coordinated fashion, the larger the groups, the more offspring per female. So that's one connection. Now, it's interesting, uh, um, there's uh, two groups in India um, looking at different both North and Southern Indian temple sites and urban contexts and they're finding some similar patterns that are associated with different ritual practices. That in fact, the human ritual practice has an impact, a cascading impact, on the size and fecundity of uh, some of the local groups. So, I mean, that's a really direct impact. Um, but I think there's a lot of more subtle things going on as well. Um, and, and one might argue macaques are a biased sample because macaques, it looks like now, we've even got some archeological evidence to support this, that macaques have been seeking out this sort of human edges for a long time. Um, so one, there's a number of people making arguments that maybe they actually even adapted as a human edge species. Um, that's been their sort of ecological edge. Um, kind of going off that a little bit, one of the other questions has, has anything really looked at, because the health of human populations that are supposed to be kind of bad with these climate conditions, I mean, is there ever any kind of focus to look at so, a group, you know, our, like so yes, our group is looking at that extensively. This has been pioneered by Lisa Jones Angle at the University of Washington and the Washington Regional Primate uh, Center. We've been looking at that extensively. Almost everywhere we've looked at the cat pathogens, we've looked at the human pathogens and you know, done the same sampling protocol on humans, blood, feces, you know, the whole chick swabs, done a lot of the analyses. Um, so I can tell you that there's some really interesting things there, but there's also a gigantic problem. A lot of this you can't help. Um, a lot of this and has to do with uh, the structure by which publishing uh, infection rates and things like that are problematic in, in, in many areas. So we were able to use some of the analysis in guiding our questions, but a lot of that analysis is not because of our agreements with local communities and with governments. Particularly, um, we're not allowed to share a lot of it. There's in fact some wonderful things I would love to share with you uh, that you know basically our, our, our agreements with governments that allow us to do some of this research. 
but I mean, that has to be understandable working in this sort of complex area. The world, the world of global health, tourism, economics, and politics are integrated in a very important way, and blood uh, means a lot. And, and the way in which people interpret what pathogens mean. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, uh, we just had a big fight with the US military. I don't know if you guys saw it. I don't read emerging infectious diseases. So last year, emerging infectious diseases, the uh, group of military doctors, US military doctors, uh, published a record of 10 monkey bites for cat bites in Afghanistan and made an argument that the number one challenge for the US military health was to keep, keep uh, soldiers from being infected by herpes B. So, first of all, we said they're all juveniles, they're being kept illegally by soldiers in the barracks. So, they probably weren't infected, and even if they were, we know that herpes B hasn't ever transferred in the wild, to you know, the best of our knowledge. Secondly, Really? That's the danger of facing troops? <laughs> so, we thought, I mean, people are so freaked out, they, they really got a lot. They let us publish it eventually once we toned down the language. But the point was, you're going to tell us that 10 monkey bites are, are the number one health issue facing, right? We didn't, they didn't let us include the STD ones. But, uh, but you know, well, uh, um, heroin addiction, sexually transmitted infections, and being shot, I think, probably. <laughs> uh, but, but this is this thing about, Primate diseases, pathogens. There's this terror of the zoonotic diseases with a very, very limited understanding of them. Um, and so, if we publish some of the stuff, like we published SFV stuff, that we know that it transfers to humans in these close contacts, you wouldn't believe the, the sort of blowback we got from publishing something about a non pathological virus that shows up in humans. Um, yeah, so. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned that the uh, barbarian macaques had very low pathogen rates. Have you looked at rates in pathogen rates in humans in the area? Oh, yeah. There too? Yeah. And there's, there's I mean, there's it's, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, the yeah. probably government won't let us. Well, so we, you know, <laughs> everyone we work with gets the, has to give us blood and poop and everything. And we, we, we have a good understanding of what the local communities look like in many of these places. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they're probably. And there are very visitors from all over Europe yeah. show up there all the time. We expected a lot of measles, a lot. But you know, Europeans' health is really good. And, and, and so, although the, the cruise ships is what they're testing. <laughs> so one thing we haven't tested for are rhinoviruses and other sort of cold stuff. Because you know, cruise ships stop in there all the time. And cruise ships hang out. I had a student who did an undergraduate student who did great uh, small-scale two-month research where she looked at visit, you know, frequency visit by tour ships at the site where the tour ship guides take them, and then looked at coughing, sniffling, and running noses in the macaques in correlation with those patterns. And she found a very, very strong positive correlation. But, So on the same thing, to, to what extent do you think that the, the transfer of zoonotic diseases between macaques and humans differs from that you find in other primate species in humans where comes more through exploitation and hunting and things yeah. kind of more opportunistic in some sense, but yet, obviously in the case of SMV and HIV have been extremely important from a right. mobile standpoint. Well, there's some really interesting probable differences between the, the, the SIV CPZ, the chimpanzee SIV suite, um, look to be particularly different than a lot of the SIVs found in other, uh, even other apes. Um, and so that, that transmission event uh, probably happened multiple times and one time stuck. Um, and it's important results. Um, but some of these other transmission events are very interesting because they do involve some kind of mucosal, cross mucosal boundary exchange, as well as biting, physical contact. Um, airborne stuff is, does not happen. What we, what's fascinating is that when people got herpes, these macaques, all, except for the barbecue, all macaques just have herpes being foaming out of them, apparently. Um, they all test positive. Now, very few are shedding, but we have no wild events, no events outside of the laboratory of transfer. There's this huge panic. You can remember thousands of people actually killed uh, when this herpes when it became apparent that herpes B was, was common among mon cat monkeys, but it's not transmitted outside the laboratory context. And so that's fascinating. Um, and why that is, we don't know. So we, we know really very little. We do know with the bushmeat crisis um, throughout uh, uh, Central Africa and, and emerging in South America that there's probably a, there's probably a lot of transmission going on in these contexts. And it's only recently become a major concern because of ease of travel. That is, these things probably happened a lot and didn't get spread nearly as, as much. Now what is interesting is that there's very little evidence for transmission amongst neotropical primates in humans. Uh, malaria is for sure. Um, and there's this really interesting recent hypothesis about the 
malaria in, in the New World and its relationship to humans and monkeys. Uh, but, but there are many fewer, many, 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 many fewer zoonotic transfers uh, between the tropical primates and humans as compared with uh, African and Asian monkeys and humans. But we know very little. And, and so, for example, with other circumstances that humans have a fair amount of contact with are, about, are the baboon species. And baboons are also used as various models for medical, right. medical testing and various sorts because of their physiological similarities, some of like the cats. Yeah. Um, and to what extent do do other differences between the macaques and the and baboons? That's that, just starting. Differences? They're yeah. just starting to look at that. There's a, a few groups now in South Africa and a few other places that are looking, using the same kind of methods and, and looking at these large scale things. It turns out that the, the zoonotic transmission is much lower, um, but there's also much less physical interaction. Part of that is body size yeah. uh, and aggressiveness. And, yeah, I mean, you, you met, you're much less likely, I think, to coexist directly with baboons. They do overlap in many ways, but conflict is a more predominant pattern. Not, not everywhere. Uh, there's something I think has to do with uh, complexity of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the comment made by the gentleman from the New School for Social Research mm -hmm. on what constitutes really real. Uh, it certainly is a move integrated anthropology is that move. But uh, wouldn't you call it a perception of what is really real? Yeah. yeah. Because we never can transcend perception. Right. Uh, we have to construct reality in a philosophical sense, but we don't have it either in physics nor in philosophy. So I would argue, I, I agree completely, but that there is a really real both the materiality and the constructive perception, right? Uh, yeah. uh, those realities, and they influence one another. And I think understanding that and using that as a baseline means formulating questions in a particular way. I don't think you can navigate through the perception to the really real. I think you can have an understanding of the diet, the interaction between that, and thus try to root different questions in different contexts. But I mean, I agree. And I'm not saying there's two things, right? There, there's, there's the way in which we approach it. I think changes and is, facilitates a broader kind of inquiry if we sort of step back and accept that complexity as opposed to sort of trying to identify human versus nature, let's say. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much.